Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Seth, for having me. Um, it's kind of cool that being the first in-person event back at the booth, this is my first book event. So super, super excited. Um, appreciate all of you coming out. Um, so I'm going to jump right in and start talking about chapters in the book. Um, while you're listening, listen out for some connect the dot um, happenings. Um, and then after we go through a few places, I'll talk a little bit about me and um, my connection to the West and um, about the book. So, okay. So this first slide, we're gonna travel 10,000 years in just this one slide. Um, the Michael C. Carlos Museum at Emory University has the oldest mummy in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the, their collection was started in 1876 and then was later moved to its current location at um, Emory University over in the Claremont area in 1919. So they've been around for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> the mummy that you see here, or the coffin lid, is not the oldest mummy. It's in the same gallery over to the right. And it's wrapped in linen, so you see the actual mummy. And at the time that that one was done, they cared more about the positioning of the body rather than the preservation of the body. Um, and the coffin lid here, it's about 17 letters, and I won't even try to pronounce it. <laughs> um, but they have um, quite a few mummies, um, humans and a couple of animal mummies as well. The middle photo is one of my, I, did, I didn't see this until I started writing the book and found it absolutely fascinating. It's, a, it's the gravity monument. So it was placed by Roger Babson, um, who attended MIT, founded Babson College, and um, he was really upset about, with gravity. He lost his oldest sister. Um, she drowned and he wrote, she was unable to fight gravity, which came up and seized her like a dragon and brought her to the bottom. Um, and he was so distraught. A friend of him encouraged him to create a learning institution to study gravity. Um, and that's what he did most of uh, the latter end of his life. Um, he founded the Gravity Research Foundation, and they placed a few gravity monuments at colleges around the country. So this is one of only a few um, that you'll ever see. <clears throat> um, when they gifted this one, this one was placed in 1963. Um, it usually came with a gift. So this one is close to the physics building, and um, Emory got like $5,000 for the um, School of Physics. Um, some schools got stock, some got cash. Um, <clears throat> This one is made of Etowah Cherokee pink marble. And, uh, and the other thing, um, so the foundation started an essay contest in 1949. Um, and this has to be s s about gravity from any direction that the person writing it wants to approach it. Um, and some of the winners are names that you'll recognize. Um, one of them, um, a favorite uh, physicist of mine, was Stephen Hawking. The silver door that you see on the far right, that is at the uh, campus of Oglethorpe University. Um, it's the crypt of civilization. So Oglethorpe University had been started um, back in 18, 1835, um, when it was in a different town in Georgia. Um, Thornwell Jacobs reestablished Oglethorpe at uh, Peachtree Road um, it's in Brookhaven, and the cornerstone was laid in 1915. So they just recently celebrated their 100th anniversary um, on Peachtree. So um, Jacobs, whenever he decided he wanted to build a time capsule, um, decided to go all out. So this thing we use uh, state-of-the-art technology, um, has about 4,000 different artifacts in it. Um, and there are models, about 800 books, models of the Eiffel Tower, of the Egyptian pyramids, um, recordings by Franklin Roosevelt, um, many others. And there's a quart of beer, a donut cutter, and a fly swatter. Um, no precious, no, no gems, no precious metals, so no reason for anyone to break in. But it has, uh, it perfectly captures civilization from 19, 
um, 36 to 38. It was sealed in 1940. And um, the date that it will be opened is 8,133. So Jacobs had found an Egyptian calendar um, many years before he had this idea. So the opening date, he took civilization backwards, added that forward to get the year that it will be opened. And everyone who contributed to building or uh, putting contents into the crypt got a brass invitation to the op opening day ceremonies, which will be May 28th at noon in 8113. So, um, unless uh, reincarnation is a thing, we probably won't be here in another 6,000 years. <laughs> All right, so um, let's tell you a little bit about me. Um, I was born in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, we moved around a lot. Um, lived in Florida again. We left when I was two, but we lived there again. Um, lived in both Carolinas, Texas, and Wyoming. Um, my sophomore year in high school, I went to four different schools in three different states, Wyoming being the last one. Um, in the summer after sophomore year, my brother and I worked on a horse ranch. Uh, I've always loved horses, so that, that was an incredible experience. Um, it was so far out of town that we'd get up real early, drive out to the ranch, work all day, stay in the bunkhouse, get up, work all day, and then drive home. And we did that the whole summer, and we did everything from cleaning stalls to moving herds of cattle from one pasture to miles, uh, miles away. So I got to be a cowboy for a while. Uh, um, the picture of the, I don't know if you can see the town. So the, the Grand Tetons were in my backyard. Um, and the town was like population 1006, something like that. And that was a number of years ago. Um, and it's grown by maybe a little over 200 people. So it's still a nice, small, quaint town. Um, <clears throat> so here at the booth, there's more than just cowboys. There's a lot of Native American um, art, um, art and art of Native Americans. My grandmother, great-grandmother, and great-aunt were born on the Cherokee Reservation in North Carolina. Um, my mother has dark hair, dark skin, cheekbones, dark eyes. I got the English-Irish on my father's side. Um, <laughs> but uh, th there is the connection to Native America. Um, so t uh, talk a little bit about the book. Um, first, this presentation. At first, the, the chapter for the booth is through the lens of the Presidential Gallery, the Presidential Signatures Gallery. Um, and I was going to do that, places in Atlanta that have connections to U.S. presidents, and then, no, 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 that's not it. Because the book series, um, it's, has, it's diverse types of places. It's all places, um, but there's like a few restaurants, there are a few monuments, there are a few museums, this and that. So I decided to mix that up for you. So what you'll see today is a little bit of everything, including some presidents. There are probably like four or five at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to get president heavy, I'm almost done. Um, so the book, <clears throat> if you've got it, it's a guidebook, 111 places in Atlanta that you must not miss. It's part of a global series. So the, um, um, they have about 400 books in the 111 places series, and they're in, they're written in English, German, Italian, French, and Danish. And about eight, about 95 of those are in English, and there's cities all over the world. Um, very fortunate to be selected to write the one for Atlanta. Um, and I first heard about this when I was at the Cook's Warehouse at Ainsley Mall um, for a cooking class with Chef Virginia Willis and Natalie Dupree. Um, I'd known Virginia for years. First time I got to see Natalie, um, which was awesome. Um, and the friend that I was there with, we bought books and we stayed for the book signing and we were the last ones in line. So we're chatting with Virginia and Natalie and Virginia told me about this book that she'd been um, offered to write. She's crazy busy. Um, so she very kindly passed my name on to the editor and about a year after that, we went to contract. Um, Sandy mentioned earlier about my middle name. So my, as soon as I signed contract, I rebranded myself. I started spelling out my full middle name. Um, there's another Travis S. Taylor who is an author um, works in aerospace here in the southeast. Um, he writes science fiction, which I love. And I was already getting emails for him, people thinking that I was that the Travis S. Taylor. So now I'm Travis Swan Taylor. Um, 
So um, sometimes people ask, how come 11, 11 places, or 111 places? Um, the publisher is in Cologne, Germany. German, Cologne's lucky number is 11. In fact, they have an annual festival that starts at 11, 11 a.m. on November 11th. Um, so they took the 11, added, added another one to it, so they'd have enough stories for a whole book. Um, that's the one, 111. Um, I love this book, not just because I wrote it. Um, it's a great size, very sturdy. You got do, um, double cover, um, rare for travel books. It's full color. Um, each chapter is um, two pages, page of copy, page of photo. Um, sometimes you have a couple photos. I have one chapter that has two, the rest of them are one. Um, and there's a sidebar that has information that has the address, website, phone number, how to get there, and a tip for another place that's um, nearby or relevant. So there's like really more than 200 places in, in the book. Um, Another cool thing I like about it, in the back, there are, <coughs> excuse me, there are maps, and the dots are numbered that correspond to the chapters. Um, the chapters are alphabetical, if I didn't mention that. Um, so if you're in Midtown, you can take a quick look, see what places are nearby. Um, it's, just, it's an awesome book. Um, oh, and the cover. So when we were first talking about the cover design, um, my editor, Karen, she's like, a peach, right? No, 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 that's Georgia. Atlanta, it has to be a phoenix. So we've got the phoenix on the front, and the blue is intentional as well. The blue is the blue from the um, city, the flag for the city of Atlanta. So a lot of um, thought went into the entire process. And, okay, back to Chuck. Any questions about the book or me? Awesome, okay. Let's get back to, did you have, okay. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. What was your source material? How did you gather this information for the book? Okay, so the question is what was my source material? How did I gather the information for the book? Um, Sandy mentioned that I've written a, a tourism blog, Wanderlust Atlanta, for the last 10 years. So a lot of the places I already knew. Um, and then to discover other places, I asked around. Um, I did interviews, I read the Atlanta Journal of Constitution back to the 1880s something, um, read a number of books. Uh, so it came from a lot of different places. Did some interviews with people at places. Um, so yeah, it was from a lot of different places. Oh, and also did a lot of research at the Keenan Research Center at the, the Atlanta History Center. So, yeah, from a lot of places. <laughs> um, okay, let's head over to Piedmont Park. Um, who's heard of the 1895 Cotton States and International Exposition? Okay, a few of us. So this um, exposition, it was pretty much a world's fair. It was the last 100 days of 1895. And it was put on to show the rest of the world that the New South could do more than what people might think. Uh, that we could contribute to the national economy and that we could foster positive relationships with, um, other, with other countries. Um, so over the 100 days, 800,000 people came to this exposition. The population of Atlanta at the time was about 75,000. We had 800,000 people come through. Um, there were about 6,000 exhibits. Um, there were, and the buildings were all built to be temporary. They weren't meant to be there forever. Um, but the, so the only remnants from that exposition are the stone um, planters and steps that you see in Piedmont Park, and there's some at the Atlanta Botanical Garden as well. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the buildings were specific to states. So one was for Pennsylvania, and we had, right here in Piedmont Park, um, the Liberty Bell, back when it used to travel. Um, so they would have themed days throughout the exposition, and when they had uh, Liberty Bell Day, 30,000 people came out to see the Liberty Bell. Um, and uh, some of the technology that they featured, uh, one was motion pictures. 
Um, but a lot of people didn't. It was the first time motion pictures had been debuted to uh, the public, but a lot of people didn't s stick with it because it was hot and the building wasn't air conditioned. Um, another technology that was relatively new um, was electricity. Um, so they had a daytime rate of 50 cent, but then it was half price at night, but they had all the buildings lit up. They had a fountain in the middle of Lake Claramir that was lit up. Um, they, had, um, they had a Ferris wheel that wasn't really a Ferris wheel. They didn't want to pay the um, uh, royalties or the uh, rights to build a Ferris wheel, so they built a Phoenix wheel. Um, but uh, it was uh, pretty spectacular. But there's also a connection to the West. Um, during the exposition, Buffalo Bills Wild West show, which had 500 employees, came to the exposition and they did, you know, from what I've read, the show was incredible. Um, but his contract didn't say how long the show had to stay. He was there for about a week, it got cold, he packed up and went back out west. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Uh, let's, go, let's move forward a little bit. So the chandelier on the left, that's um, the focus of this particular chapter. It's in the, the chandeliers are in the front Peachtree Street lobby and the rear lobby of 191 Tower, and you recognize it on the skyline because it has the double crown. Um, that building was opened in uh, 1990 um, to not so great fanfare. Um, it was an end of an era of opulence, and journalists were saying, it's too much, it's not going to contribute anything to the skyline, blah, blah, blah. They were wrong. It's, it's beautiful. It's one of my favorite buildings on the skyline. Um, the chandeliers are almost exact replicas of the ones that um, hang in Grand, or Grand Terminal Station in New York City. And the guy who built the ones that are in New York built the Flatiron Building in downtown Atlanta, which opened five years before the famous Flatiron Building in New York. See the connect the dots now? <laughs> we'll have a bit of that. Um, this one, this one I love. And even the idea of the, the chandeliers, that's a seven story lobby. These things are massive, they're so, they're so huge. Um, absolutely beautiful. And Okay, this is a statue of Samuel Spencer. Uh, Spencer was the president of six railroads, um, including Southern Railways, which today is Norfolk Southern. Um, he passed away, um, presumably in his sleep, on a train ride um, up in Virginia or Pennsylvania. Um, but as 30,000 employees got together and paid for uh, commissioned this uh, statue to be built. And for 60 years, it was at um, the Atlanta Terminal Station, which was a huge um, train station for passenger. I don't know, they may have done um, cargo, but I think it was primarily um, passengers. Um, but if you see old photographs of the station, it's massive and then there's a parking lot, and then the statue faced the terminal. <clears throat> and it was there for 60 years. It's since been at three different other locations. Um, but the cool thing about this statue is it was sculpted by Daniel Chester French, and the architect was Henry Bacon, and they had worked on other projects. Um, notably, the uh, DuPont Circle Fountain and the Abraham Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. And some have said that the Spencer um, statue probably was a prototype for the Abraham Lincoln sculpture. So, Sandy, that's the connection to Lincoln I was telling you about. Um, after um, the big terminal in downtown Atlanta was closed, the statue was moved to uh, Peachtree Station, which is the only passenger train station we have now, which I think is really odd since we were built on railroads. Um, and it services, when it first opened, um, 
back in 1918. If you see the station, it looks like it was built yesterday, but it was built more than 100 years ago. Um, when it first opened, it served as six uh, passenger trains. Today, it services one. Um, but the Spencer was there until um, the 96 Olympics. Then it was moved to Hardy Ivy Park, which is where uh, Peachtree and West Peachtree come together in downtown, um, close to the SunTrust building. Um, and then after that, sometime after that, it was moved to the Good Building, which is at Peachtree and uh, 15th Street, which is where Norfolk Southern offices are now. And if you've seen in the news, Norfolk Southern is building a new headquarters behind the Fox Theater. So I haven't heard if it's gonna get moved over there, so maybe it'll have a fifth home. Um, but for now, it's um, uh, close to the sidewalk, so you can see it when you're walking or driving by. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You'll hear Hardy Ivy Park a few times. Um, about to go there again. So this is the Carnegie Education Pavilion. Um, Andrew Carnegie was a true rags to riches story. Um, he immigrated from Scotland and his first job in the US was in a button factory. Um, he made his money in different ways, eventually railroads, and um, later in life he sold his company to J.P. Morgan for $450 million. Um, I can't imagine what that would be today. Um, but then in his later life, he gave away $350 million, so quite the philanthropist. Um, and part of that money was to, get, was to build the um, Carnegie Library in, da in downtown Atlanta, um, which was the South's first public library. Um, and it was there until 1977 when they tore it down um, and built another one, not nearly as ornate. Um, but some of the columns were saved and um, used to build um, the Carnegie Education Pavilion. So around the sides are engraved names of famous authors, and on the floor on the inside are nine seals of Atlanta colleges and universities. Now you might be asking, so who are these people? Um, uh, um, David the Spartan is a friend of mine. I met him through his wife. The others, and they're all members of volunteer cosplayers of Atlanta. Um, cosplay is costume player. Um, and Dragon Con every year, <coughs> is, which is Labor Day weekend, would have been next weekend, brings 70 to 75,000 people, a lot of them in cosplay. And the Education Pavilion is one of the most popular spots for photographs. Um, so we, that was a fun day. We tried for months to organize it and the weather wouldn't cooperate, um, on and on. But the Volunteer Cosplays, Cosplayers of Atlanta is a volunteer, obviously, organization, and they do um, cosplay character appearances at um, nonprofit children's events. So kids get to hang out with you know, Superman, Black Panther, Wonder Woman, um, which is pretty cool. Um, it's at Hardy Ivy Park. Where? So it's high, um, Hardy Ivy Park. So it's on Peachtree Street, um, where Peachtree and West Peachtree come together. It's right across the street from the SunTrust building. Um, as this is the Erskine, Erskine Memorial Fountain. It was Atlanta's first public fountain. Um, it was also at um, Hardy Ivy Park. That little park, and it's just a tiny, it's smaller than this room. Um, has seen a lot of things over the years. Um, the fountain was gifted by Ruby Ward. Um, her father wanted to present it. Um, John Erskine, thus um, it having his name. Um, and he was a federal judge appointed by President Andrew Johnson. Um, he passed away, but his daughter uh, presented the fountain. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the city had a dedication event. 1,500 citizens showed up. And then Mayor Porter King gave a speech citing the responsibility for municipal government to care for the fountain. Didn't happen. It fell into disrepair. It, had, it was vandalized. It was um, an embarrassment. So eventually got moved over to um, Grant Park in 1912, where it sat for more than 100 years um, in disrepair. Fortunately, there's a new foundation, Friends of Erskine Fountain, 
and uh, the Grant Park Conservancy and a few other organizations are bringing it back to life. So they're restoring the fountain to its former glory. It has another level, which they're working on right now. It had dippers, um, and they're restoring the bench that's around it, um, which has uh, aquatic motifs. There's a dolphin arms, and there's some fish um, on the side, and then uh, medallions of um, all 12 zodiac. I don't know the story behind that. Um, but the place where they put it is one of the old entrances to Grant Park. So they're also going to restore an overlook that overlooked a lake in Grant Park that was drained in the 60s. So they're going to restore the fountain, the bench, and the overlook. I don't know if the lake will ever come back. We'll, we'll, we'll find out for sure. Um, this, so Martin Daw, he uh, started Cherry Lion Studios. And I think a lot of people, um, resident and visitors alike are fans of his work but don't realize it. He has a lot of work, and all of these are his. It's a lot of work um, throughout Atlanta, the Southeast, and the country. Um, his most recent installation was the MLK statue, um, which was uh, dedicated on the 54th anniversary of uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Uh, the statue's eight foot tall on a base, uh, and a three foot tall base. Um, and it's on the grounds of the Georgia Capitol building, and it's the first statue of an African American on the Capitol building, so um, grateful that it's there. Uh, the one in the middle is um, Dogwood Bench, so it's a bronze bench, and it's meant to be interactive, so you can sit on it, make photos, and I've actually dubbed this the best I've been to Atlanta photograph. So you've got the benches in front of Lake Clara Mere. This is in Piedmont Park. Um, with the Midtown skyline in the background. And it was dedicated, I, I got to attend the dedication, um, and um, it was on the occasion of the Atlanta Dogwood Festival's 80th anniversary, I think it was 2016. Uh, so the Dogwood Festival donated the um, sculpture to Piedmont Park, who hosted the uh, festival for a, what, a perhaps all of the 80 years, uh, but for, very, for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> and the Dogwood Festival is it's the third oldest fine arts festival in the country, um, and the oldest such event in Atlanta. Um, and there's another chapter in the book that talks about planting of dogwoods even decades before um, the Dogwood Festival in Piedmont Park. I don't know if they're connected or not, but it's interesting that Dogwood's always been a part of Piedmont Park. Uh, the statue on the right um, is the World Athletes Monument. Um, it was uh, put in in 1996 for the um, Olympics. It was commissioned by the Prince of Wales Foundation for Architecture, and it was presented by Lord Morris, representing Queen Elizabeth II. Um, if you missed, the dedication of the statue, you probably saw it in the news in 97. This is where Atlanta mourned the death of Princess Diana. And there were so many people coming in, leaving flowers and mementos that uh, police had to bring in traffic control so that people could get around in that part of town. Um, and this is also on Peachtree Street, close to Rhodes Hall. Um, so he has a lot more um, works out there. Um, super nice guy to have visited the studio. Very cool space. Um, so I mentioned lots of different kinds of places in the book. There are a few restaurants. Um, ask any of my friends, I'll tell you, Five Church is one of my favorite restaurants. Um, not just because of the amazing food or the atmosphere. Um, become friends with the owners, Iman and Valerie, over the years. Um, but send the book through the lens of the artwork. There's so much art in this restaurant. So if you go, I encourage you to walk around and you know, ask about it or um, enjoy it. And a lot of it has to do with, or in some way tied to the number five. Um, five church, so they got five into a lot of the artwork. The biggest piece of art is the ceiling. <clears throat> Ceiling's painted black and in white letters has the fifth century Sun Tzu's The Art of War. And above the 32 and a half foot bar is in giant letters, um, the tenant, there is only we, which is um, a motto that the restaurant has adopted that speaks to teamwork. So they, kn they know that it doesn't take one person or one team, it takes the entire organization to make it a, make it a success. <clears throat> um, 
There's, if you're of a certain age, you know what a buffalo nickel is. Um, there's a huge one in the restaurant and it's made from found materials by um, a Georgia native, William Massey. And then one of my favorite pieces is called The Fifth Dimension. Um, it's by the artist Ishmael and it's based off of a 1925 photograph of Five Points in downtown Atlanta, but it depicts uh, the past, present, and future. So you've got you know, the old buildings, the old cars, people walking. You've got hoverboards and UFOs. It's like a little bit of everything. Um, so check out the art if you go there. It's really amazing. How's the food? The food's awesome. It's um, New South, New American. Um, they're chef, I've met the new chef. Um, awesome and has some new dishes on the menu. The last chef ended up um, participating on Top Chef or one of the food show competitions, did, did very well. Um, yeah, it's always been good. If you go try the fried green tomatoes, um, they cut the tomatoes, put pimento cheese on it, then cover it, then fry it. And there's a basil oil and a paprika oil, yeah. <laughs> um, so this next one is the Sonoya Area Historical Society Museum. So we're, we're north of Atlanta, that's south of Atlanta. And I put this in the book and in, in this presentation to uh, make the point that I believe that you don't get the full experience of Atlanta unless you go OTP and in ITP. Um, if you're watching on Facebook and you don't know OTP, ITP, inside the perimeter or Interstate 285 circles the city. So ITP, OTP outside the perimeter. Um, I have friends who don't venture out OTP very often. They're so missing out. Um, and the ones who do venture with me, they totally agree. Um, so Sonoya History Museum covers um, Native, American, uh, Native Americans who lived there before settlers came in to present day to um, things that have been filmed there, like The Walking Dead, uh, Fried Green Tomatoes. Um, and I found it, just, you know, I'd gone down for a tour of The Walking Dead film sites and went to the visitor center on Main Street, asked them what else there is to see. They told me about the museum and went over and it's amazing. Um, the gentleman who gave me a tour is now the mayor of Snoya. Um, and if you go down there, you can tell who's local, who's not, by the way they pronounce Sonoya. Um, I'm not from there, so I say Sonoya. The locals call it Sonoy. Um, and this city is named after Chief William McIntosh, who was a um, uh, Creek Indian. And he was one who drafted and signed a treaty that ceded Indian lands to the U.S. And the president at the time enacted it into law, took the land, um, and Chief McIntosh ended up being killed by his own people because that treaty was never ratified by the Indian Council. So it's lots, lots of history there. So, um, and the house is separated into five different rooms um, and they um, displayed the artifacts chronologically. Um, and they're happy to give a tour uh, when you go down. Um, this next one I love. So the book is about places. Well, I kind of went out of the box with this one, Atlanta's Canopy. <clears throat> and the book lists um, a number of different places from where you can see the canopy. Uh, my favorite, by helicopter, um, which is where all these come from. So it's a little bit about the canopy. So the Atlanta's Canopy is 47% of Atlanta is covered by trees, which is 20% higher than the national average of cities our size. So pretty impressive. Um, we're called a city in a forest um, for obvious reason. Um, the photograph on the left, you can see the skyline in the background. So it's going left to right, downtown to midtown, so south to north. Um, Stone Mountain, the top of Stone Mountain in the middle. On the far, you can see the same skyline and then on the far right you can see um, the Buckhead skyline as well. And if you've never noticed, um, it's very obvious here, um, that skyline traces Peachtree Street, um, our main street, uh, all the way from downtown to Buckhead. 
So they, the buildings might not be on Peachtree, a lot of them are, but they're very close to Peachtree. So you can see Peachtree right there. Uh, the building on the right is um, One Atlantic Center. It was the IBM Tower when it opened in 1987, the year that I moved to Atlanta. Um, and it was a departure from architecture that Atlanta had seen for decades. So that um, tower started uh, um, a new revolution in Atlanta architecture, and it's, it's still, one of my, still one of my favorites. Now, this next chapter was in the book before the pandemic uh, came around. Um, a lot of people, even locals, don't know about this one, but the CDC has a museum, and it's magnificent. Um, it's multi-level. Um, they have a fantastic art program, and um, the artifacts chronicle the history of CDC, and they usually have, have temporary exhibits that um, focus on work in a, per a certain part of the wor uh, world or um, a certain disease. Um, but it's a little fun too. They have the contamination suits that you can put on for a photo op. Um, they're closed right now, but when it reopens, uh, I'm sure they'll be sanitized and we can do that again. Um, and specific to what we're going through right now, the photo on the right is uh, a 1952 iron long. Um, and it was used uh, by um, I forget his name, but it was used up in t for this one gentleman's um, entire rest of his life. Uh, so it's in it for quite a few years. Um, the CDC Museum, like the booth, is a Smithsonian Affiliate Museum. Um, and just highly recommend going to see it. Um, I said that a lot of people don't know it, but that's because it's only open during business hours. So Monday through Friday, nine to five. A lot of us who do the nine to five job wouldn't have any reason to even know about it. but do a staycation, go see it. There are other places that are, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, okay, um, this photo is, um, it may be one or maybe two of this photo only in the world. Um, so you got four different things going on here. The blue wall that you see um, just behind the green wall is from the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, which is where the Atlanta Braves um, first played in 1966. That was Atlanta's foray into Major League Baseball. We had a ball team before that played um, across the street from Pont City Market, um, but they weren't uh, Major, League, Major League Baseball. Uh, the green fence is where Hank Aaron hit his 715th home run um, in 1974, breaking uh, Babe Ruth's record. Um, and interesting uh, tidbit, Hank Aaron had joined the Milwaukee Braves, which was the team that moved to Atlanta to become the Atlanta Braves. Um, when he joined the Milwaukee Braves um, in 54, his first at bat, first time he was ever at bat, he had a home run. Um, so that's cool. Now in the background, you'll see the Olympic cauldron, which was from the 1996 Olympics. And then I blew up the cauldron a little bit. That's earlier this year um, when the Olympic running trials came through town. Me and my best friend went down and took photographs of the runners and got to see the cauldron lit. It was the first time it had been lit since 1996. So you've got all those four points in history in that one photo. You know, we happened to walk by, nobody else around, so it could be the only such photo in the world. Um, am I doing on time? Okay. So this one, the a uh, photograph of the line on the left is what's in the book. Um, there are four of them out front of the uh, Marriott Marquis. And I just threw this one in to show the depth of research that goes into something like this. Um, it took me four months to find out what the name of these lions were. Um, one of the reasons it took so long is because there's, they're called uh, the Lions of Atlanta. You ask anyone local, what's, where's the Lion of Atlanta? They'll tell you the one in Oakland Cemetery that's you know, um, in the Confederate soldier um, burial um, area. Um, but these are also the Lions of Atlanta, but in French, Le Lion d'Atlanta. Um, they were by a, um, a Belgian sculptor, and they were commissioned by um, John Portman, a uh, famous architect, world-renowned architect, um, who did a lot of the buildings downtown. Um, so the photograph of the inside of the marquee, I've mentioned Har Hardy Ivy Park a number of times. Um, Hardy Ivy was a person, and he was one of the first settlers 
in Atlanta, long before Atlanta was, uh, became an actual town. And if you ever find yourself at Pulse, um, at the Bluefin uh, Cocktail Lounge, um, you'll be in proximity of one of the earliest settlers of Atlanta. So you're present past at the same time. Um, and I have a question. Yeah. That's the, the Marriott shot. Is there, there some interesting movie trivia? Oh, uh, there is. There have been a number of films done there. Um, one of them was um, The Hunger Games. Um, not Catching Fire maybe the third movie in the series. Um, but there's several shots within the marquee that are, um, it, yeah, that are in the film. Yeah. Um, and that's the one with the blue f uh, pulse. There's Dragon Con going on. It's like, I told you I like sci-fi. Um, the Booth Museum. Um, so has everyone here been to the booth before? Anyone not been to the booth before? <laughs> Okay, so we do have a first timer. And I know we have some folks on Facebook who are watching who've not been here. You need to come here. Uh, the booth is a Smithsonian Affiliate Museum. Um, it's the second largest art museum in Georgia. And it's the world's largest permanent exhibition space for Western art. Um, and a lot of the art is, um, they have some, um, some very well established um, artists, but they're also focused on contemporary artists. Uh, so you see a lot of the um, tags that show uh, the lifespan of the artists. A lot of them don't have, they're still living, um, which is fascinating because it looks like it's been, you know, they're doing some old west art, um, but they just did it. Um, and I love their tagline, um, explore the west without leaving the south. Um, that right there is an excellent reason to come visit. And be sure to um, check out the uh, sculpture galleries. There's sculpture throughout, but there's a sculpture gallery inside and on the grounds. And they do um, ask about the, sculpt, um, the sculpture gallery tour that they give as well. Um, so the photograph on the left is um, the chapter for the booth. That's the Millar Presidential Gallery. President, yeah, Presidential Gallery. And they have um, a portrait and a signed letter by every president from George Washington to present day. Um, having lived in DC, it's like, you know, drawn to it, uh, that in history. Um, highly recommend seeing it. There's some sculptures in there too. Um, so now we're into president, so we're almost done. Um, this is at the Southeastern Railway Museum in DC. In DC. Oh my goodness. Um, at the Southeastern Railway Museum in Duluth. Um, this train is a one of a kind. It's the only privately owned rail car to carry the body of a US president who died while in office. Um, this was um, Warren Harding, who was elected 100 years ago this year um, and won the election largely by um, uh, the woman vote. Um, he was a popular president until after his death when some scandal came to light. Um, but on this trip, he was doing a cross-country um, tour um, and speaking engagements, specifically in the West, um, to gain um, popularity and support from that part of the country. And he also went to Alaska. He's the first president to visit Alaska. And he had a lifelong dream come true while he was there. He'd always wanted to be a train engineer. And for 51 minutes while he was there, he got to control the train driving through Alaska. Um, so dream come true for him. Um, from Alaska, came down to San Francisco. He'd already started feeling sick. Um, in San Francisco for a couple of few days, he passed away. Um, they put his body on this, uh, the Pullman rail car, elevated his body. And on the trip from San Francisco back to DC, three million Americans came out to pay their respects along the tracks. Um, during that trip. Um, the South Lake, there's, this train museum has like 90 pieces of rail car, uh, four working engines, and they have buses and fire engines and all kinds of really cool stuff. And a lot of them you can go on so you can see what train travel was like decades ago. Um, so I mentioned there's a lot of different president um, mentions in the book. 
Uh, I'll go through these quickly and then we'll do some time for Q&A. So the Randolph Lucas House is now the Randolph Lucas Jones House. Um, it was on Peachtree Street at um, Lindbergh. Um, it's been moved twice. The first time was moved it up a little bit on Peachtree Street so that they could build a huge condo building. Um, and then it was used, um, actually first it was built for Nick, Nicholas Randolph, who was the great, great grandfather of Thomas Jefferson, you know, the presidential connection there. Um, not too many years ago, um, Christopher Jones and Roger Smith um, created a nonprofit uh, preservation organization and they moved the house from Peachtree to Peachtree Circle, um, which is um, in Midtown um, between Rhodes Hall and 15th Street. Um, and they fully restored it and um, Christopher passed away this January, complications of <coughs> cancer, but so we the, um, added Jones to the name of the house. Uh, but fortunately he got to see the um, preservation of the house before he passed. Um, the photo in the middle are, is at the, um, the Wren's Nest, which was the home of Joel Candler Harris, um, who's famous for the Rare Rabbit and Uncle Remus stories. Um, the house was, it's in West Atlanta. The photograph here is of um, some Rare Rabbit story characters. Um, and it's actually in a humidor. We can put cigars in there. And the president connection there was uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who um, helped make the home into a museum. And he was friends with Harris, so he's visited the, the home a number of times. And he gifted Harris a taxidermied owl, which is on display inside the house. Um, the third one, Woodrow Wilson. Um, Wilson was born in Virginia, but raised in Augusta. Um, and I love what he said in a letter about Atlanta when he was trying to figure out where he wanted to live. Um, he wrote, after innumerable hesitations as to a place of settlement, I have at length fixed upon Atlanta, Georgia. If more than any other southern city offers all the advantages of business activity and enterprise, there appear to be no limits to the possibilities of her development. And I think to grow up with a new section is no small advantage to one who seeks to gain position and influence. Um, so he moved to Atlanta and at 48 Marietta Street in downtown, he opened a law firm um, with a business partner from school. And so his dream was sound, but in that time in Atlanta, there were 143 other lawyers. So as a young attorney, he didn't get a lot of work. So he eventually left, went to Johns Hopkins High School, earned a PhD, one of, if not the only president to ever earn a PhD, um, and went on to become president of the United States. Um, oh, and he's also one of only four presidents to win a Nobel, uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Yes? So what is that uh, picture of? That picture? That's the building that's had the address. It was 48 Peachtree. Um, he lived in an apartment w with his business partner um, at a house close to the SunTrust building. And there's also a monument to uh, Wilson in Midtown, close to Ansley Mall. So yet another presidential connection. Um, that's all I have. We have... <laughs> huh. Questions, questions. That's a lot to digest, isn't it? it is. <laughs> Jeff asked that earlier. Um, it depends on the category. There's, I have so many favorites in here. Um, I often speak about the Crypt of Civilization, the one that's at Oglethorpe University. Um, they also have an art museum, so they're in there twice. Um, and that art museum has a Buddha that's 300, and, no, it's 650 years old. Um, also, I was a docent at the Atlanta Botanical Garden for a number of years, so even though it's a popular destination, they have in the Japanese garden, there's um, a Japanese lantern um, that was donated to Atlanta back in the 1960s. Um, it wasn't by our sister city, it was by our sister state, uh, Kiko, Kikoshima Prefecture. Um, 
this year that lantern is approximately 325 years old, which unless you go on a tour, you're not going to know. Um, so it's, I'm you know, uh, happy to be able to bring that to light. Um, just, I have so many favorites, so many favorites. Um, I'd love to hear yours after you go through it. Um, Jeff? I'm going to turn this wrong uh, for you. What's one place we have to miss in Atlanta? <laughs> <laughs> place that you have to miss. Um, the, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know. I haven't turned back to any place. And all but one place that I asked were happy to be in the book, um, which was fantastic. It was, it was really a great experience. Um, it is about places, so it's not about people or events, um, even though some are worked in through the lens of the place um, that's being talked about. Um, the one thing that we don't put in are bookstores, because you know, we don't want to play favorites. Um, and also why we do uh, a sampling of different kinds of places, don't want to do too many restaurants or too many of this. Um, one thing that this publisher does is an annual update so, which will be very important right now because I know of at least one place in the book that has closed because of the pandemic. Um, so we'll get to do some rewrites and um, keep it up to date. Uh, so we already have the list going for that. Sorry, I didn't answer your question, but maybe. And you know, um, what do you think people don't get about Atlanta? What do people not get about Atlanta? Um, We're not that complicated a town, but we, we are at the same time. Yeah. Um, uh, one th okay, this one, and this goes back to OTP, ITP. Nothing is that far in Atlanta, um, especially if you know what time of day to go to get to where you're going. Um, you don't have to sit in traffic all day. Um, and there's always an alternate route. I learned that when the bridge collapsed, um, the I-85 bridge collapse was that last year. Um, Waze on my phone became my best friend the next morning. Um, and uh, I thought I knew my way around Atlanta. Waze showed me so many other ways to get around. So I think getting around and um, it might just take a little bit more planning. Um, you're looking at maps and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, you can see a lot more than you think you can see. Yes? So who didn't want to be in the book? <laughs> 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 Just one place, not calling names. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, uh, the Paralympic Monument is in there, which is in Centennial Olympic Park. Um, and the, uh, like the Coke Museum, the aquarium, those are very popular, so everybody knows about those. And this is more about getting people uh, to go out and explore their own backyard, not going to the same place all the time. Um, but I got to go to the opening ceremonies at the Paralympics in 96. Uh, Christopher Reeve was the master of ceremonies. Um, it, it, it was fantastic, yeah. Denise. Well, if you were to author 101 Places in Georgia that's outside of this, mm -hmm. can you give us a secret uh, of something else that maybe a little bit further outside of town that you would put in that book? Oh, wow, wow, wow. Um, there's so, so much. Yeah, yeah. So you could give us some advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dahlonega is a favorite. You've got not only the wineries, but it's the Gold Museum, which has so much history. Um, and Savannah, there's so many things to see in Savannah. Um, and they have some fantastic tours there. Um, oh, 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 and the Georgia Guidestones. If you've not been there, it's in, it's in Elberton, Georgia, out in the middle of the state. Um, and these, we don't know who who commissioned them, but they were built a number of years ago. And I think it's written in 12 different languages, and it's the instructions of what civilization should do should there be an apocalypse. And it's like, yeah, keep the population below half billion, and I mean, it's all these different things. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of an oddity. Yes? What was your writing process like uh, for those that find book writing? Rabbit. <coughs> Rabbit hole after rabbit hole. The research was my favorite part. 
Um, I thought I knew Atlanta really well, having written my blog for so many years, but I learned so much more. And I'd read about this, oh, that's interesting, oh, that's interesting. Oh. Three hours later, oh, I'm still writing this. So the one thing that I did learn, um, and I've always wanted to be an author, but I didn't realize the amount of discipline it takes to stay focused and meet deadlines, and it's, it's, it's a commitment. Uh, don't, don't go into it haphazardly. Yeah. Be committed and, yes, sir? In the course of your research, did you come across any commonly held myths that you were able to dispel? Commonly held myths? Um, not really. There were a couple of things that, cha that it learned that the script was different. Um, there was one, um, actually Denise here told me about there's a monument to um, a Union general. So yeah, I thought they were all Confederate monuments, but no, we have one to a Union general, um, uh, McPherson, right here in Atlanta. So that was um, not really a myth, but a surprise. Okay, well, everyone, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you to the booth, and I'll be right over here. <laughs>